I'm looking forward to, uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, it's great to be here at NASCOM. Uh, wonderful to be back at a live event after the horrors of COVID. Um, I will be, uh, as you know, interviewing Janmi Siha, uh, Sinha, excuse me, the chairman of BCG India. Um, we've been asked to speak about some of the biggest issues of the day, um, the disruption and fragmentation of the global economy. Uh, the COVID pandemic exposed the fragility of the global supply chains, um, especially companies' reliance on China. And then from a year ago, the war in Ukraine um, caused the worst inflation in decades, which we're still in the grips of. And um, our central banks are, are struggling to contain. Um, on top of this, we have the challenges of a change in climate, which are becoming clearer by the, the, the year and the day. Um, some political scientists are even using the word polycrisis to describe our overlapping um, and mutually reinforcing crises, uh, which are not only economic in nature, but all feed into the economy. Um, without being too gloomy, alongside all of these threats, there are opportunities, um, and not least for a country like India, an emerging economic power uh, that is, I think, uniquely well positioned to take advantage as investors um, change their strategies and um, begin to hedge their bets away from China. Um, so I'd like to ask Janmi a few questions to start. Um, if there's time at the end, we'd, I'd like to take a couple from you guys as well. I think we have a big clock in front of us to keep us on time. Um, so my first question is the biggest one. Um, is globalization as we know dead? And if so, what has replaced it? So uh, to my mind, globalization is a fact, not a policy. And so it's, it's something that will be ongoing. And these discussions around uh, globalization being dead uh, just doesn't appreciate the world as we live it. Uh, if you really look at things today, the nature of globalization will incorporate areas where there will be active cooperation, areas where competition will get more accentuated, and areas where there will be conflict. But the shift will be not so much whether there will be globalization or not, but how people will do risk mitigation given the nature of the global world. And how will they do that, you think? So, you know, if you really look at it, what are the big threats which are there? There is a very, very abiding threat around technology and IP <clears throat> and the different uh, systems of governance between uh, authoritarian state-run regimes and corporate enterprises. So how will the, the, what will be the underlying protocol? In these areas, there will be conflict, and people will only let go of those things that they can let go of, and countries will develop their basic natural uh, self-preservation uh, requirements. So India will create semiconductors because it cannot avoid it as a country uh, that it is. There will be, of course, uh, in, the, in the developed Western world, I think most companies will be creating a China dependency index. You know, how much am I dependent on which feedstock right. uh, from China? How much of my market is there? What is the IP? What are the critical technologies? What are the critical raw materials that I need? And can I actually deal with uh, a situation where there is a breakdown in, in, that, in that supply? And, and people will adjust to that. But uh, there will, of course, be active areas of cooperation. You know, you look at climate, space, health. Uh, you, you can't avoid it. Hopefully, nuclear. There will be cooperation here. There'll be cooperation as yeah. well. Yeah. And what's the specific opportunity for Indian business? And if I can pin you down specifically for Indian IT uh, technology businesses. So, you know, I, uh, to my mind, one of the biggest trends that got totally missed out in Davos this year. Everyone in Davos talked about geopolitics, about data and technology, and about sustainability. No one talked about demography. And the fact is that the world is aging. And the developed world is aging even faster. And many countries are going to have declining populations from here on. 
So the next billion people in the world, from 8 to 9 billion, will come from nine countries. India, Pakistan, and seven African countries. Mm. So this is a stark fact, you know, and, and uh, how will we deal with it? There are 1.5 billion people over the age of 65. And if I was to ask the audience to guess, what is the fastest growing age group today? If anyone could, I would really clap. Does anyone have a Can chance? Can you take yes? us for that? It's over 100. Yeah. Oh. Over 100. Wow. Would you believe that there are 6.9 million over 100 people in the world today? Uh, you know, it used to be something which maybe I don't even look forward to, right. you know, that kind of a lifespan. Right. But it's a fact. Mm. And uh, the 54 million people in the U.S. who are over 65, on them $22,000 a year is spent on health care. Mm. And, you know, with, with the fact that pension, uh, the age for pension in most of Europe is not rising, and immigration has always been so sensitive. So how will these unfunded mandates be met? Mm. And I think that's a massive opportunity for India. But of course, opportunities are, you know, are well, and you know, you can talk about opportunities all you like. You have to take advantage of opportunities. They don't fall in your lap. So you're suggesting there's a match between these aging populations in the, the West and your much younger labor pool and tech companies in India? And if so, if so, how does that work? So, you know, you look at it on the full spectrum, from the high end, India produces the most number of engineers in the world today. And uh, on the other hand, you have uh, an average age of 27. I forget now, I think there are 550 million people under the age of 25. And so, if you have this need, I hope the next, uh, next rush of H-1B visas, and this will be an uh, unpopular thing to say at NASCOM, will not be uh, uh, IT service people, but uh, nurses, oh. you know, and, and doctors go, going and, and providing the needed health care right. in, in the world, you know. And also, on the other hand, data services, you know, for health. Uh, remote consultation, remote testing, right. you know, and then even medical tourism, the whole spectrum mm. is an open space, but, you know, it'll have to be taken advantage of. So demographics is one of the big drivers of, yeah. of um, how Indian companies can profit. What, what are some other ones? What are the, the other areas where, where Look, India has a USP? The, the, the basic, uh, you know, India has always struggled in manufacturing. It has always struggled in manufacturing because the cost of capital has been high, the cost of power has been high, you know, the ease of doing business. While it might be easier to do business, mm -hmm. it is not easy to do business in India. Uh, but the difference between easier and easy is large. So uh, a lot of companies struggle in manufacturing. Mm. We, uh, the struggles which have, we've actually not had in the same way in services where the imprint of, uh, of regulation is less. Right. And we have done well in those places. Yeah. And so uh, I think th that whole space is for India to take. Right. And then of course, you know, we have not taken advantage of some things that we've had. I mean, it's a shame that small countries in different parts of the world get more tourists than India. Even tourism within India is not picked up. Right. I come from the poorest state in India, which is Bihar, but it's the state of, of Buddha, mm. you know? And we had his entire, uh, the, the Buddha route, so to speak. Mm. But we don't really capitalize on it, you know? I right. mean, and then, you know, you'll have, uh, people imposing themselves to be able to experience this from Japan. Yeah. A Japanese tourist 10 years ago was spending 54,000 rupees a day in India if they came to visit, mm. which was one and a half jobs in Bihar. Yeah, yeah. Just think of it. A lot of room to grow. And you were suggesting manufacture could grow, manufacturing could grow as well. I wanted to ask you a bit about government policies and PLIs and there's quite a lively debate in India now around whether you, and I'd, I'd be interested to, if there are any questions later about this from the room, whether you promote manufacturing or whether as India you 
build on you know, your proven strengths and your comparative advantage so, in, in IT and in back office work? I mean, what? Yeah, so I don't believe governments are good at picking winners. But governments can help assuage and, uh, and alleviate risk. So to the extent that we uh, you know, do risk mitigation by getting, attracting people into some industries that we need, that's OK. But I don't believe the government should go into the area of picking winners. So there are some PLIs which I might support, and there are others which I wouldn't. I'd ra much rather we just become more competitive. And, but uh, being a consultant, it's dangerous for me to have this conversation. I, I was about to put you on the spot. Many of my clients will start yeah. saying, what the hell were you doing <laughs> in NASCOM? I'm very, See, this yeah. is a service industry environment, so people out here won't abuse it. It's me. a safe space, but I'm, uh, exactly. I'm curious if, if you don't mind going there, which industries do you, do you think should, should be getting PLIs and, and where is it um, more diminishing returns perhaps? Look, I truly believe that, play, you know, a country as large as India cannot not have semiconductors. So we need to find the best way to attract the Avenese companies into India and whatever we need to do to do that, we must do. You know, mm -hmm. there are certain uh, key technologies, 5G, you know, uh, to the extent that we can get uh, semiconductors. I think we need that. Mm -hmm. Whether we should support different manufacturing verticals, mm -hmm. I am not so sure. Uh, other than, so that's, that's, that's one exception. I like, you I like uh, you know, I don't want, I will not mention which ones we should not support, yeah. because I will get lynched. So <laughs> I don't want to get lynched. I'm still OK, you know, my hands and legs <laughs> move. So I, I, I'll stay away from that. But I would say that there are those places which we really need, and there right. are others which we should debate. Which we should, yeah, for a longer discussion, perhaps. Um, can I get you to talk about digital public infrastructure in the India stack? Um, I mean, your, your government leaders are, I think, rightly making a big deal out of, um, you know, how India does this, which is quite different from how the United States or the EU um, have done, done data, data protection, um, building the, um, you know, digital economy. Do you think India has something to, to offer the world, and if so, what is it? Yeah, in fact, a former NASCOM president, Nandan Nilkani, has been a true visionary and leader in this space. You know, if you really look at it, at essence, we now believe that data can be converted into wealth. Uh, in some countries, that data is owned by the government. In some countries, that data is owned by companies. Uh, Europe has made data access just difficult. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, the regulatory overhang around GDPR mm -hmm. is not simple. What India is trying is to give data to the individual citizen because Indians will uh, be data rich much before they are uh, middle class. Mm -hmm. So if they can use their data to uplift themselves in, in whichever way they can, it will be a good model to think of. So in this way, you know, we are trying to, uh, in, it began in financial services, it has moved into health, now it's moving into government services, where we are giving the individual control of their data. So you can have a bank account, you know, in state bank, but we will force state bank to share that data with any lender mm. who might be able to uh, give you a loan at a more competitive rate. You know, those are the account aggregators. And then we are doing that with the COWIN, you know, with the, with the healthcare stack. And then we are moving into government services. So that's the state stepping in um, into your stuff, into, into a citizen's data, but presumably in his own interest. That's what yeah, you're saying. Actually, the state is not stepping in. The state is saying, Corporation X, you might have this data, but you don't own it. Mm -hmm. It is still owned. So if Janmajay Sinha has an account with Access Bank, I own that data and mm -hmm. not Access Bank. Mm -hmm. And the government and the regulator is just facilitating that. Right. And so that's, and, and then you look at our uh, technology stack in different, different areas. It is truly remarkable. You know, I mean, uh, I spent a long, lot of my life in financial services. <laughs> and we used to talk about financial inclusion as this mountain that we would never climb. Right. And in 2015, you know, uh, about 47% of the Indian population had access to a bank account. 
Right now, that number would be 97%. You know mm. what I mean? So it's happened very, very dramatically quickly. Mm. And that entire change has made uh, leakage of government uh, policies much, much tighter. So, you know, you have everyone with a mobile phone, everyone with a unique identity called Aadhaar, and you have everyone with an account. And so you can actually transfer money directly to them. There was a time some 40 years ago when a prime minister would say that for every rupee that the government gives in subsidy, mm -hmm. 15 paisa reaches the uh, benefic intended beneficiary. Mm -hmm. Those ratios are changing. Yeah, indeed. Um, can we return a bit to the, the stuff we were talking about in the introduction about China plus one? And I'm, I wanted to drill down a little bit more. Uh, do you think that's a valid proposition or do you think it's a bit of a gimmick? Is, uh, and indeed, is this something that India can, can profit from? Is it, do, do, do multinationals go to you know, one other country when China's looking wobbly? And how, how viable is India as a proposition when they're doing this? So I think this China plus one is simplistic. China plus many. The dependence on China has become risky in some areas or over a certain level. So people want to uh, bring in resilience and uh, reduce the risk in their supply chains. Right. And China can't be substituted by one country. It'll be substituted by many countries, right. Southeast Asia, India, Vietnam, Ethiopia, Bangladesh. All these countries will fill in in different areas according to their competitive advantage and according to their income levels right. and, and productivity levels that they are competing against with China. To expect that it will be China plus one means India. It's only the one can get misread as I, but that doesn't mean India. That means right. anyone who's willing to take advantage of that. And I don't think there's any single country, China or the no, US or, not, or anywhere else. China that would, is large. It would, but also that would um, replicate the entire manufacturing, at least in manufacturing infrastructure that they have. And in fact, now the world will not take that risk again. Right. No one wants to be dependent too much on one country. Yeah. So we will diversify. I mean, most companies will diversify their risk and they will actually start looking afresh, you know, at, at different supply chains. And also there is a lot of reshoring, friend shoring, and every new word around shoring, you know, which, which comes about, yeah. which, which, will be, which will be taken. So you agree with the principle, but instead, I think you're saying instead of China plus one, it's China plus N, yes. or, you know, exactly. insert a number there. Okay, great. Um, thank you. I did want to leave time for some questions. I always find this, this part the most interesting, if, if there are any in the audience. Please make yourselves known. I see one, one hand over there. If you could introduce yourself and stand up, that would be wonderful. Gentleman over there, if someone can get him a mic. Yeah, hi. This is Manoj Marva from EY. Uh, my question is to you, Janmia, that uh, India and China are not best of friends. We start literally staring at border eye to eye. But I honestly feel China is the best friend India could have had uh, because manufacturing would have never moved to India if China wouldn't have done what they're doing. But what intrigues me is that why is China doing this to itself? And what is it gaining out from it? Sadly, I don't have a direct line to Xi Jinping. <laughs> uh, it, it's really hard to tell. You people but do. Uh, he's certainly helpful. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that, that, was a, that was a brain teaser. I see gentlemen in the second row. Good question, but and probably not one we can answer. Hi, this is Amit from LNT. Question is that, uh, you know, over the last couple of decades with, you know, manufacturing shifting to China, uh, we got used to, uh, you know, cheap goods, if you may, right? Like Walmart effect and also uh, low cost of capital. Now with you know, the shift away from China, is there gonna be a paradigm shift in terms of low inflation and uh, low cost of capital that we've seen over the last couple of decades? And how that may impact you know, the global uh, economy and GDP growth? You know, the, the, the truth of the matter is that uh, wages in China have really gone up. So we can't take anything static over time. It's just deceptive. <clears throat> and uh, if, you, if you really look at what has happened right now, during COVID, $5 
trillion dollars. That is just imagine, almost two Indias was given as stimulus into the American economy. At the same time, when migration slowed down. So what happened was that you had this massive push of stimulus and supply chains broken at that stage initially. And then after that, with COVID fear, services not taking place, right? So what was going on? All that money was going towards goods. So goods prices were really rising. Now with COVID now getting over, you know, services are also starting to come in. But migration was not happening. So, you know, the labor situation was tight. And the people who were close to retirement had gotten enough money to decide to say, let me just retire. So the labor force has gotten tight. And so we have this strange situation where if you were Jerome Powell, there are many jobs you might want, but you don't want his job. Because he's trying to deal with inflation with a tight labor market. And so he's, in a sense, trying to force a recession of some kind to bring down interest rates. Now, of course, the problem is that while he's having to do that for the US, he tends to affect us all. But you look at inflation, it's not been the same. If you just take broadly, broadly, US is a $22 trillion economy. Europe is a $17 trillion economy. China is a $16 trillion economy. And Japan is a $5 trillion economy. And that's 70% of global GDP, right? And they are be dealing with the, 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 each of them has a very separate situation. Because the US has had this massive stimulus. Europe has suddenly had to deal with spiking energy prices. You know, commodity prices have spiked. And China is doing its own thing. You know, it's, it closes the economy, it opens the economy. And, and so <laughs> it, it, it's very difficult to predict. And during this period, Japan, which for the last 40 years was wanting some inflation, said, here's my chance at inflation. And then, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it, it found, oh, I'm sorry, I just didn't switch it off. Uh, it, it has found that it can't, it can't deal with that, right? So here is the, the strange situation that we are found, uh, finding ourselves dealing with. And supply-led inflation and demand-led inflation are dealt with differently. So how do we deal with this? It's not easy. And that's what is creating this massive uncertainty in the world. Mm -hmm. And smaller countries, and especially like India is an oil import. We are being helped by these oil caps. But otherwise, we'd have a disaster right now. You are. And, and by the lack of stimulus spending, yeah. I think yeah. you're saying as well. What are the, uh, sorry, I, I wanted to ask one more question myself. What are the trends on wage growth in India? Are they still? Um, healthy are you getting into you know a danger zone of your own I mean the country is developing and one of the fastest growing economies in the world right now so the, wages go without use really the worst data in India is employment data the you know people say hey 56 percent of our economy is dependent on agriculture oh. that's just untrue 56 percent of our population is rural they are also dependent on agriculture. Mm -hmm. They all have service jobs, you know, of, of various kinds. Many of them are migrants, spend yeah. nine months elsewhere. To try and calculate what our labor force is and, and uh, what, uh, what price inflation there is, is really the weakest statistic really we have. So I really find it hard to speculate on whether wages have gone up or down. Right. Uh, I, but, uh, you know, the, the fact is that luckily right now, luckily I say from a BCG perspective, there is some uncertainty. So attrition has really fallen. Yeah. So you don't need to spike uh, salaries right I now. I mean, something we're hearing about um, as journalists from the desk rise it is uh, a, a big sort of um, bidding up of wages for the top talent, especially in tech. So it seems like at the sort of um, the, the top cream of your economy, the best jobs, the wages are going up very, very fast. And I'm wondering how that fits in with the sort of broader picture here. You know, uh, things change on a dime. A year ago, the whole world was talking about how difficult it is to attract tech talent. Mm. Now, you look on the west coast of the US, every day you hear a bigger number of layoffs. Mm -hmm. That tends to have a spill-on effect over time. You know, a lot of H-1Bs are now trying to figure out how they stay on in the US. Right. So if companies were, uh, were alert and agile, 
they could be hiring a lot of really top talent right mm -hmm. now from the from the west coast but you know the the speed of change has become so fast that our mind doesn't necessarily adjust to this change right and we have to keep looking at the facts every day and allow them to tell a little bit of the story rather than what our images and impressions are. So do you think India could be a big, bigger importer of tech workers as well? I mean, the, the cliche or the, the history, it's more than I mean, cliche. A lot is, of them will the get opposite. repatriated and we need to be able to take advantage of that. Sure. Okay. And your visa regime is in, in, in I, place I think your um, th the thing has stopped. You know, it's not, uh, it's not moving, so I don't know when oh, you're going okay. over. You have to tell us. It was an innocent question. It was not a leading one. <laughs> Do we have any more questions from the audience? Now's your opportunity. Yeah, there's a gentleman there. Is there a mic for him? Sean Neighbors from Taskus. Um, I think we, we talk about industries and particular components and having to replicate those back. And uh, Apple did a, a test and they tried to actually make an Apple phone in the US. I think it was in Austin. And it was super challenging because the entire, you know, the, the, the whole demand um, and the whole infrastructure along the way wasn't replicated. But, the phone part was, and so they did it in order to, to gain favor and, and whatever, and it was difficult. So when you talk about the, you know, either the, uh, si the silicon industry or, or others, how do you incent the entire supply chain to happen at the same time versus just the one area? I, I don't believe the entire supply chain will get restructured. Only those parts where you don't want to bear the risk. So there is no problem in importing things from China as long as there are substitutes available. You just don't want your dependence to be such that if there was, uh, if there was real action against you, that you fell apart. You know what I mean? That the, the, the supply chain resilience is the term. You know what I mean? It's not that you want supply chain substitution. You want resilience, you know? Mm. Isn't, isn't India very vulnerable already on a lot of, a lot of key inputs do come from China. I realize this is, <laughs> I'm on um, shaky ground here. Um, in pharmaceuticals and tech and so on, a lot of the inputs that go into the goods that you make in oh, India yes. do come from China. You are vulnerable. Uh, absolutely, no, no, no. Yourselves, uh, we've been looking at it the other way around of yeah, yeah. money yeah. coming here, but you yourselves. Absolutely, absolutely. And I cannot tell you how many companies have created a China dependency index. They are looking very sharply to figure out what is their dependence in which areas right. and how, how risky that dependence is. Mm. You know, I mean, it's this just in time has gone. Mm. It's more just in case, you know. For sure. Yeah, indeed. Um, any more questions from the audience? I think we have run out of time. I think we ran out of time. I think we're getting kicked off. Thank you, John. May wonderful discussion. Um, I think we'll talk more afterwards. For more interesting content, like, comment, and subscribe to our NASCOM YouTube channel.